Good morning. Thank you to everyone for coming out at what is, at least for an academic, a very early hour, probably not so much for you. Um, I'm told I have to introduce myself, so hello, I'm Sharona Hoffman. I'm a professor of law and bioethics at Case Western Reserve University, and I'm also the co-director of the Law Medicine Center. So it's a pleasure to be here. Medical practice in the United States and really all over the world is undergoing a dramatic transition. We are leaving behind the familiar paper files and we are transitioning to a paperless world, to using all electronic health record systems. And this transition is very exciting. It could cause dramatic improvements, but it also raises a lot of concerns and problems. And I'm going to be talking about this transition and its implications. So the work that I'll be discussing is actually work that I do with uh, a co-author, Andy Podgursky, who's a professor of electrical engineering and computer science. And he's also my husband. And um, people always ask, how do you retain a marriage and work together? Well, so far, so good, though um, I don't think he's going to make it this morning. He said maybe, but I left him reading the New York Times at home, and I guess that's where he stayed. So um, nevertheless, he's contributed a tremendous amount to this and uh, really has taught me a whole lot about the technical aspects of this technology. So we have um, a fairly ambitious agenda for the hour we have together, but I think we'll manage to cover it. I'm going to be talking about what electronic health record systems are, what EHRs are, what they do, what their benefits and risks are. And they have considerable benefits, but also some very worrisome risks. I'll be raising some legal issues that are associated with the use of EHR systems. I'll be talking briefly about regulatory oversight, what regulatory landscape has been established for electronic health record systems, and I'll be critiquing it. And finally, I will try to end on a positive note and talk a little bit about um, a great potential that electronic health records give rise to, and that is in the research area. I think we'll be able to do some research that we haven't been able to do without this type of computerization. So let's get started. What are electronic health record systems? Well, they are record systems, but they also go far beyond that. So you may have already had this experience. Uh, Clinicians, nurses, doctors, and so on will be inputting information directly into the computer rather than jotting down notes. So it will be a record system, uh, a record keeping system. However, they're also going to do a lot of other things. So there will be clinical alerts and reminders. Messages will pop up on the screen saying, remember, this patient is allergic to penicillin, or it's time for the annual mammogram or some other uh, screening test. Sophisticated systems will also be able to provide other forms of decision aid. So you might be able to type in symptoms, and the computer will generate uh, suggestions for diagnostic tests or diagnoses or even treatment plans. They can provide links to medical literature so that the doctor can do research regarding the condition in question. Computerized physician order entry. This is quite important. This allows physician, physicians to send orders directly to the pharmacy or to the lab so you don't have to take the little sheet of paper with you. Secure messaging. That allows doctors and patients to communicate electronically in a secure fashion. And PHRs, personal health records, those allow patients to log into their account and obtain information about their test results, uh, appointment schedules, and other information. And I think the Cleveland Clinic already has this MyChart. 
data analysis tools will enable physicians to search their records. So let's say a medication such as Vioxx is recalled, the doctor would be able to search all his files, figure out who is taking that medication, and communicate the relevant information to all those patients very quickly. And interoperability. This is also very important, but we're not moving quickly in that direction. Interoperability allows different systems to communicate with each other and work together. And ideally, we would have a national health information network where all systems in the United States could communicate. And so if you go to Florida for the winter or you go to a different system for a second opinion, those doctors with proper authorization would be able to log into your account, get all of your medical history, uh, all of the details about your condition, even if you don't remember them or are confused about them. And if you are taken unconscious to the emergency room, they wouldn't have to treat you in a vacuum. They would also be able to log into your um, records and find out everything they need to know about you. So that could vastly improve outcomes. However, we're not achieving interoperability right now. Right here in Cleveland, uh, we have two different major systems. Cleveland Clinic and Metro Health have EPIC, that is one EHR system. UH purchased a completely different one, and the twain shall never meet. The two cannot communicate, so that's a big problem. All right, so why is there enthusiasm about this transition? Well, the benefits are considerable. First of all, these systems could potentially reduce errors. And so those alerts and reminders can be life-saving, and other features can be life-saving. So there's an account of a doctor who typed in 10 times the amount of the appropriate dosage, and the computer system caught that, told him it was wrong, and had him correct that. That kind of a feature is extremely helpful. And that obviously can improve patient safety. They've been shown through studies to be particularly effective at improving preventive care. So if doctors get reminders about testing, about vaccinations, and so on, they very readily comply with those kinds of prompts, even if they're a little bit more resistant to other types of suggestions about actual management of um, treatment plans. So preventive care has improved with the alerts and reminders. They can facilitate communication both between doctors and patients and among members of the treatment of the medical team who can all log into the account and look at the same information together, get all the information they need about the patient, and better communication can often lead to better outcomes. And advocates say that there will also be considerable cost savings. And I've read a very optimistic estimate uh, that says eventually after 10 or 15 years, we might be able to save up to $77 billion annually. Why is that? Well, first of all, you get some administrative efficiencies. You don't have to hire people to file paper records. You don't have to hire people to uh, do all sorts of mailings. It's all done through the computer. Also, if you do reduce errors, you obviously can save the costs of treating complications that are the result of medical errors, and that can include lengthy hospitalizations or even surgeries. You save those costs. And finally, you might be able to save the costs of duplicating tests when you go for second opinions. If all the test results are in the electronic records and everybody can get that information, they don't have to do the tests over. All right, so that is the story through rosy lenses. However, there's always another side to the story, and those who are less enthusiastic say, no, actually, this transition is very costly and very burdensome. And so first of all, in the short term, it does cost a lot of money to 
purchase and implement one of these electronic health record systems. There are now subsidies that are available, which I'll mention in a little bit, but at the outset, I've read the estimate in several sources, it can cost about $33,000 per doctor to purchase one of these systems, and then $1,500 per doctor per month for maintenance. And so there was a study that came out in 2010 that said that at that point, only about 17% of physicians and 12% of hospitals had multifunctional EHR systems. Almost everyone now does electronic billing and they get some test results electronically, but it's much more rare to have these kinds of multifunctional uh, EHR systems and it's even more rare to have practices that are essentially paperless. Now, I think the rate of the adoption is accelerating because of the subsidies that have become available. In fact, there's a lot of pressure to adopt these quickly. Both uh, President Bush and now President Obama have said that the goal is to have all Americans' health records computerized by 2014. Most people don't think that will happen by 2014. That's getting closer and closer, but that is the goal. All right, so you not only have costs, you also have to do training. You have to make sure that everyone in your office is competent and comfortable using the electronic health record system. And I talked to someone at Kaiser who said that in his practice group, they had to reduce the patient load by half for a couple of weeks, and that is just to do the initial training, not any continuing training. Now, you can do that at Kaiser probably because there are a lot of doctors around that can take care of patients, but a small practice group is going to find this extremely challenging. And you also have to adjust all your work habits. And so doctors have to get used to working with a computer in the treatment room or at the bedside. And that is a big adjustment for someone who's used to just talking to the patient, examining the patient, and jotting down some notes. And patients have to get used to a computer in the uh, examination room or at the bedside, and some of them are quite resentful. Some of them say, huh, now the doctor cares a lot more about the computer than he does about me. He doesn't even look at me. He's just fiddling with the computer. So that can be problematic. So let's talk a little bit more about some specific shortcomings. So one concern is information overload. When doctors had their folders that we're all familiar with, there was a summary sheet at the beginning, there were tabs which made it easy to navigate the record. Now all they have is a computer screen. And if there isn't good search capability, and a lot of these do not yet have good search capability, it can be very, very difficult and time consuming for doctors to find whatever detail they're looking for. And doctors have complained a lot about that. Also, the idea is that we have one comprehensive record that covers the patient from birth until the present time. And from a medical malpractice perspective, doctors might be held responsible for knowing all the details because they were just a few clicks away. So the doctor won't be able to say, oh, a different doctor handled that problem or the patient didn't tell me. Well, you should have found it. It's right there among thousands of screens. Along with that are data display issues. And again, the technology can improve and solve much of this. But right now, people say, well, the font is the same for everything. We can't tell among different types of information. These systems are not that user friendly, are not that easy to navigate. And that can be a problem if you have a whole lot of patient, patients and not a lot of time to treat them. Copy and paste, I've been reading a whole lot about this. So this is a feature that is meant to save time. So you're supposed to be able to copy narrative from prior visits and insert it in the current visit so you don't have to type everything from scratch. 
But of course, if you don't edit it carefully, you insert errors into the record that can be um, the basis of erroneous treatment decisions. And so there's one account that um, there was a patient whose leg was amputated a few months ago, but the current visit notes are still talking about the infection and pain in the leg, even though the leg is long gone. So somebody didn't edit carefully, and that introduced errors into the record. Decision support. There's Andy. Andy, I mentioned you. Good to see you. Good morning. <laughs> So decision support, of course, can be life-saving if you get accurate alerts and reminders that prevent the doctor from making mistakes. But again, there are problems with the technology. So doctors complain that they are inundated with alerts and reminders that are about trivial things they don't really need to know about, that don't apply to this patient because she's been tolerating the medication well for several years. And Having all these alerts and reminders is distracting, again, takes time away from other work they should be doing. Some of them just turn off the feature altogether, and then they're going to miss critical alerts and reminders, which obviously is problematic as well. And software de defects and computer shutdowns. Also, that's a huge danger. Now, when all you do is word processing, writing law review articles, this kind of thing can be frustrating. You lose a few footnotes, have to do it over, oh no. But in a clinical setting, again, it can be life-threatening. And this does happen. I know uh, in October or November of last year, I heard the Cleveland Clinic had a computer shutdown. They couldn't access their EHRs for about 24 hours. I did not hear that anything terrible happened to patients. I don't know if it did but that is a huge concern, especially if you don't have good backup of paper records. Other concerns, time constraints and system demands. So there are studies that show that the average patient visit is maybe 15 minutes, and I actually don't remember the last time a doctor spent a full 15 minutes with me in the room, except for the annual physical. And as we said, now they're going to have to be dealing with computers. And these computers can be very demanding. They ask for a lot of information. They won't let you move to the next screen unless you give it all the information. Apparently, the patient's weight is a big issue for these <coughs> EHR systems. You have to put it often, input it often. I don't know why, but that kind of thing takes time away from doing other work. And doctors can be upset about that. They can say, I have to fiddle with the computer. I can't spend the time examining the patient, listening to the patient, trying to figure out with my intuition what is going on with the patient. And that's to the patient's detriment. Uh, and as we said, patients can be re uh, sort of resentful of what's going on in the room with the computer. There are ways to address that. It's been suggested you put the computer in a spot where the patient can look onto the screen as well, and the doctor sort of includes the patient and says, well, let's see what your last cholesterol test results are. And so maybe there are ways to handle it that address some of these concerns, but it's still challenging. Input errors. Of course, we had errors in pa paper medical files, and they cost thousands of lives. But it's naive to think that this technology will eliminate those errors. You're going to have people typing under time pressure, and so it's very easy to invert numbers, to actually type information into the wrong patient's record because somebody forgot to log out properly, all of these mistakes have happened uh, and can be very costly for physicians and for patients. Electronic communication. Patients love this. Wow, you can email your doctor. Eventually, he'll answer the email, email maybe. But everybody has to be trained about the limitations 
of this capability. So patients need to understand that in an emergency, you don't email because the doctor might just be checking once a day. You still call 911. And it's even been, been suggested if you're advising medical practices and your clients have email with patients that you have an informed consent form where the patient actually signs, okay, we're going to have email, but I'm not going to rely on it, especially not in an emergency. And doctors need to be trained that if the patient needs to be examined, don't be tempted to just shoot back an email, take an aspirin. You know, make sure you tell them to come in when that is appropriate. And doctors need to understand that the email can become part of the record. It's not like a phone conversation. It actually probably will be recorded by the computer system. So it's evidence. Patient access to PHRs. This also can be a wonderful feature. Patients can get their cholesterol test results quickly and so on. They don't have to wait for the doctor to remember to call them two weeks later, maybe. But that, too, has to be managed. You do not want a patient getting a cancer diagnosis by logging into his account when he's alone at home um, and when there's no appropriate counseling or anyone for him to talk about to talk to. So some information is going to have to be withheld and obviously still conveyed in the clinic setting with appropriate support. Privacy. Well, that's a whole different topic. There's a whole different lecture about this, so I will just mention it very, very briefly. When you computerize, you have to worry about hacking and stolen laptops and misplaced laptops and inadvertent disclosures, someone emails but sends it to the wrong person, and intentional disclosures uh, that also happen. Now, we have the HIPAA privacy and security rule. They do establish some regulations and some safeguards, but they're not comprehensive. We've written a big critique of them, and so you still have to worry about that. All right, since I'm a law professor, I'm going to focus a little bit about litigation concerns. So if we do get more errors because of some of the problems that I've covered, is there going to be increased litigation and liability? And I've heard contradictory things about the reaction of malpractice insurers to this tr transition. I've heard sometimes that they are providing discounts for people who are adopting EHR systems on the theory that these will reduce errors and save costs. On the other hand, I've also heard that some uh, insurers are pretty nervous about this because they know that when you get new technology, you can make new mistakes, and so they are boosting premiums a little bit. So I don't know if anyone has had any experience with this, I'd be curious to hear about it. To what extent will use of decision support be a defense in litigation? Will doctors be able to say, well, I have decision support, the computer told me what to do, I followed the suggestion, and that's my defense? I don't know. That might come up in litigation. Will EHR system vendors routinely be added to any malpractice case on the theory that maybe part of the allegedly adverse at outcome is due to something that went wrong with the computer? Well, why not? Vendors are probably deep pockets. We haven't seen a lot of it, but I was in a con at a conference in D.C. a few weeks ago. We were talking about it. It's sort of puzzling. Maybe plaintiff's attorneys simply haven't figured out that this is a smart thing to do. Just add them in, settlement value or settlement potential goes up. And so I would predict that we will see vendor vendors added more and more into malpractice um, lawsuits, and maybe that will change if, if we give more lectures like this. On the other hand, Andy tells me that it is very, very difficult to prove 
failures of the EHR system because it's very complex. So the problem can be in one line of code out of millions. And you're going to need very capable, sophisticated experts to testify about that. And those experts might just be too expensive for many litigants. And the problems that trouble clinicians also trouble plaintiff's attorneys um, and maybe defense attorneys. It's harder to read an EHR system in discovery than it is to read the traditional paper files. And so you can have fragmented displays. You can have hyperlinks in the electronic records that actually are not even produced when the record is produced for discovery purposes. So you can have incomplete data. It can be very, very difficult to review this new type of information. On the other hand, of course, we have to tell the other side of the story. So there are potential litigation advantages. If we do get good search capacity, we might be able to discover the truth much more readily. The system is supposed to record every medical encounter, every intervention. Audit trails are supposed to record everything that the computer itself did. So you would know, did something go wrong with the computer system? Did somebody go in and change information after she was supposed to? Et cetera, et cetera. So you will have a much more comprehensive record than we have with paper records. And instead of having to comb through cabinets full of paper records, you might be able to do electronic searches that give you the details you need instantaneously. So again, a lot of this depends on the technology and how easily you can search the records. But it's interesting to think about the litigation implications. I haven't seen very much written about that. All right, so at this point, we used to get pretty worked up and say, well, you know, there are all these benefits, but there are also risks, and we don't have adequate regulation. We have regulation concerning privacy and security, but that's not the whole story. We don't have a lot of regulation that addresses safety, that addresses quality control, that tries to make sure that these systems don't generate errors that are going to hurt patients. And so that changed a little bit in the summer of 2010, because President Obama's stimulus plan not the Health Care Reform Act, but the stimulus plan in 2009 included the High Tech Act, which was meant to promote adoption of health information technology. And it, in fact, dedicated $27 billion to support the transition to EHR systems. So hospitals and clinicians can get up to $44,000 from Medicare or over $63,000 from Medicaid if they adopt a, an EHR system. As I said, the goal is to have full computerization by 2014. And so the government just didn't start giving out money in a vacuum. It also established some regulations, and I am told that some of these subsidies are already being handed out. And so we have some regulations, happily for you. I'm not going to burden you with all the details. I will tell you just enough so that I can start tearing them apart and critiquing them. That's my job as an academic. <coughs> all right, so if you want the money, you have to show the um, Department of Health and Human Services that you are using them meaningfully and that you have purchased a certified system. So meaningful use. That has to do with making sure that you don't just buy the system and put it in the basement, but that you actually use it in ways that will improve patient care. And we actually have three phases of meaningful use. Um, we have phase one in place. Phase two of the regulations was supposed to come out in the summer. Do you think it came out? No. 
right? So we already have a delay. Phase three is sometime in the future. Phase one establishes very basic uh, requirements. There are 15 core objectives and then a menu of 10 others and you get to choose five of them. So you have to be able to use your system to do certain things. And a lot of those things are basic data entry requirements. Uh, you have to be able to transmit a certain percentage of your drug orders electronically, 30 to 40 percent. You have to implement one decision support rule. If you can attest that you're doing all of that, you are eligible for the money under the meaningful use requirements. There also are certification criteria. You can't just buy a system that was cobbled together in somebody's garage. It actually has to be certified. And the certification criteria just are designed to enable you to do the things you're supposed to do for meaningful use. So those criteria pretty much mirror the meaningful use criteria. So they just look to make sure that the systems have the appropriate features. And finally, the question is, who will do the certifying? And HHS probably wisely delegated that, that work, the certification duties, to authorize testing and certification bodies, ATCBs. These are actually groups that are members of industry, and they come together as a group. They are overseen by HHS, and they use tools and procedures that are approved by ANC. ANC is the Office of the National Coordinator within HHS. Right? So they do the certification work. So I promise to get to the exciting part, the critique, and here it goes. Why don't I think that this provides comprehensive protection? A major, major gap is that there is no clinical safety testing. They look to make sure these systems have certain features, but they don't actually place them in, the, in a clinical setting and test them for a while. They don't try to make sure that they are usable. They don't try to make sure that they don't generate mistakes that are going to cost patient lives. And this is inconsistent with the approach that we have to drugs and devices. We do have clinical safety testing for drugs and devices. These systems are going to be also safety critical. They are going to manage a lot of aspects of patient care. It doesn't make sense not to test them in a clinical setting over a period of time to make sure that they are doing good and not compromising patient care. Along with that, there is no continuing review of EHR systems after certification. All right, so they are certified, they are deployed in the market, and that is the end of oversight. There is no mandatory adverse event reporting. I am told that there is some voluntary adverse event reporting to the FDA, but then FDA doesn't do anything with those reports. We have to have this required. We have to make sure that vendors are responding to complaints are fixing problems, that if there are really serious problems, the government can intervene, and that we build a record that future purchasers can look at so that they know if the, this system has had problems, if this system is a good fit for their practice, if this system is going to be a system that is reliable. So that's highly problematic not to have adverse event reporting. Also, not everyone is required to comply. You only have to comply if you want the money. And I actually am hearing that some practices are saying, forget the $44,000, we don't want to deal with regulatory compliance. And so they don't have any oversight whatsoever. And finally, if the ATCBs are going to be doing the certification work, how closely will they really be monitored? They are members of industry, so we have to worry about conflicts of interest. 
Are we going to get situations where ATCBs are going to tell each other, I'll certify your EHR system if you certify mine? And will they apply uniform rigor to the testing process? Will, they, will we get forum shopping where it becomes known that some ATCBs are more lenient than others and that's who everyone wants to use? And finally, will the competence of all members really be monitored, especially if there is turnover? Will we be making sure that all the individuals responsible for this task are qualified and diligent and doing the work well? All right, so I've probably raised the anxiety level. I want to bring it back down by focusing on the positive, on the promise of health information technology. And as we said, there are great potential clinical benefits. There are also significant research benefits. So you might have heard the term comparative effectiveness, and this is in the Health Care Reform Act. There are provisions that are dedicated to promoting comparative effectiveness research, which is research comparing the benefits and harms of different interventions and strategies to prevent, diagnose, treat, and monitor health conditions in real-world settings. How are we going to find out information from real-world settings? We're going to look at the electronic health records. Now, right now, according to research, doctors have certainty about the treatment that they are prescribing only maybe 25% of the time. The rest of the time, they do pretty well, but they're just using their own experience or intuition. And how many of us have gone to the doctor and the doctor says, well, let's try this medication and see if it works. And let's try that dosage and see if it works. We'll probably need to adjust, but yeah, it'll be OK. Hopefully, you won't suffer too many side effects, but maybe you will. Right? It would be much, much better if they knew exactly what to do for you the first time around and didn't have to do these kinds of experiments. And so electronic health records could help promote these advances. There's a lot of discussion of using de-identified records to build research databases, and some of this is already ongoing at a small scale, but we could make it much larger. They'll be de-identified to try to protect patient privacy, though there's also a literature that focuses on the fact that you can probably re-identify de-identified records if you try hard enough. So you can't eliminate all concerns. But anyway, we would use de-identified EHRs in order to conduct large-scale observational studies. Um, using patients with all sorts of demographics all over the country. Millions and millions of records would be available. And so we would be able to fill knowledge gaps and promote what's called evidence-based medicine. And that could lead to great advances in medical care in the United States and all over the world. So I've sort of given you an encyclopedia of everything we need to know about electronic health records. Um, I will open it up to questions in a second. I've given you in the materials, uh, I think probably not the full eHealth Hazard uh, article, a chunk of it, and then a second article having to do with the new regulations. You can find all of our work on that SSRN site, or you can email me and I can send you anything you want. So you have some literature. We have a lot of other articles you might look at if it's relevant for you. And now I'll be happy to take questions. And I know there are microphones coming around. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is really short, and that is, uh, how many EHR systems are there? Are there six or are there hundreds? It, it, you know, going with how you, the control and the interaction and all that sort of thing. Right. Um, so there are actually hundreds of vendors right now. Um, there are only a few that are really popular that are being purchased by places like the Cleveland Clinic or UH, but there are hundreds of vendors. Many people predict that many will go out of business and will be left with only a handful. 
That's actually another concern that a lot of people talk about. What happens if you buy it from a vendor who goes out of business and then you don't have anyone to support you, anyone to fix your system? Do you have to throw it out? What do you do? And then uh, unrelated to that is, what about billing systems? How do these interact with billing systems, including how do they interact with insurance companies and EOB you know, procedures and that sort of thing? Right. So that's part of the EHR system that is built right into it. And uh, some critics say that one of the functions of EHR systems is to increase charge capture. And so <laughs> one of the things that the doctors do that takes time is they click on what they did. And then that translates into billing. But it's easy sometimes to click too much. Oh, yeah, I did this, 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 and this. And then the insurance company is billed for things that weren't necessarily done or really done thoroughly. But billing is a big part of it. I have a cloud question. Um, it, interestingly enough, where you're standing two years ago, uh, Vivek Kundra, who was then the chief information officer for the United States, stood there. And I talked to him after. And he said, you'd be out of your mind to spend 10 cents on Epic or any of these legacy systems, because uh, the cloud is where the, all the stuff should go. There are enormous privacy and legal issues, though, with the cloud. Have you looked at the cloud and some of the high-tech uh, uh, issues related to the cloud? Andy, do you need to come up here, maybe? <laughs> I don't know too much about the cloud. Andy, come, come here. You can sit for the questions. You don't know the cloud either? You know the cloud. <laughs> well, talk, you have to go to the microphone so they can video you. Ah, okay. Andy Podgorski. Thank you. I, I didn't expect to answer your question. <laughs> you dressed up, though. So Thank, yeah, that's the problem. Um, yeah, so there, there certainly is interest in EHR systems that are, that are saying the cloud just means there's, there's servers in the Internet that are, that are hosting the system. So there certainly are existing web-based EHR systems. and. Arguably, it makes a lot of sense uh, for a variety of reasons. It would take a lot of the uh, responsibility for maintaining the technology out of hospitals who are not very good at that and presumably put it in, in companies that know, know their business and uh, can handle the technical side much better than the hospitals can. So there is a lot of potential there. There are, as you mentioned, great security issues. There are also reliability issues. What happens if your internet connection goes down for an extended period of time and you can't access your records? So there, uh, you know, there are, there's a tremendous promise in cloud-based uh, EHR systems, but there are serious risks. And I'll be interested to see how different vendors, as they come forward, uh, address those risks. The other problem is how do you, as a provider organization assess those risks with respect to a particular company that you're considering dealing with. Uh, you know, if they have a long record of, of uh, you know, uh, happy customers, that's a good thing. But if they're a newer company, how do you assess whether they really are going to be reliable, whether they're really going to address the security issues adequately and so forth? Dale. Yeah. Uh, do you anticipate, that since uh, uh, the electronic health record will have an impact on the care of patients, and uh, that FDA would eventually be asked to, in some way, serve as a regulatory agency? It's like they do the devices? Right. So that's an excellent question. Uh, FDA has apparently stated that it thinks it has authority already. It's just choosing not to regulate these systems. The IOM just came out with a report last week, I don't know if you saw it, that recommends against giving FDA regulatory authority because they don't really have the technical expertise. They say a new agency should be the one examining adverse event reports and so on. So it's still not clear. Right now, the Office of the National Coordinator within HHS has the regulatory power, but they're not doing a whole lot yet. A second question relates to the issue of interoperability. 
and uh, with individual physicians uh, to the extent that doctors haven't totally sold out to hospitals uh, and there are individual practitioners out there who may have a variety of different systems that, that may be similar or unrelated to the system that a particular institution hospital would have. Uh, what effort, if any, is there on the part of uh, regulatory agencies or HHS or whatever to try to address this problem? Which, uh, which will seriously affect the utility of the whole system. Right. I mean, it's certainly something that is talked about. The term interoperability is out there. I think they are trying to promote interoperability at a very regional level now, but there's nothing mandatory. And if there's nothing mandatory, it's not going to happen necessarily. Look what happened here in Cleveland. I'm completely baffled as to why UH would purchase a system that can't communicate with Cleveland Clinic and Metro Health. But that's what happened. And I don't see how that issue is going to be corrected because they invested so much money in it. Um, and so until it becomes mandatory, until it becomes part of some regulatory system, we're just not moving in that direction. Thank Hi, you. Mariel. Good morning. That was elegant. So for as a physician who can practice, has patients in, in different systems, there is a limited ability to be registered to get information from the system that, you know, isn't the primary one. But, you know, I really don't understand why, is there, is there, Andy, this is probably for you, is there actually no way to to facilitate the communication between the systems, or is that just theoretically impossible because this, the organizations don't um, do anything to facilitate It's certainly not theoretically it. impossible. I mean, there's, first of all, you can obviously exchange PDF files, uh, version, PDF versions of the record electronically with no difficulty right now, as long as uh, all parties involved can understand the record, if you can understand the other hospital's record format and, and so forth, that's fine. What's, what's more difficult is uh, being able to treat a record on an, uh, uh, hosted by an, another provider and another system as if it was native to your system and, and do all the processing with it that you can do with your system and display it using the same screens and so forth and, and actually per, if you need to enter data and so forth. That's what's difficult. Basically every company has their own proprietary uh, data format which is inconsistent with every other company's data format. And the biggest problem seems to be incentives. There's not a lot of incentives for the vendors to provide interoperability. It's a lot of work, and it just helps. It makes it easier for customers to switch systems. So why would they want to do that? And uh, I've heard some representatives of vendors say, we're, we're really serious now. We're going to do it. <laughs> but uh, actually, the last time I heard that was a couple of years ago. And, there has, hasn't been a lot of progress. There are, there's an organization called HL7, which it, it does provide standards for different types of interoperability. It's been around a long time. They claim to be working on this, uh, but the progress has been extremely slow, and the, the main reason seems to be the incentives. I was just curious how these systems get updated. Like, for example, you were saying that the tests come up that the people might need that you know the patient might need well, what if like it's a mammogram and let's say there's they say now you get one when you're 40 but in five years they say you get one when you're 45 like how does that get updated and what standards do they use to even determine that information is it more like what insurance will pay for or is it more I mean how do they do that and how does it get updated right so Updates often, first of all, are automatic the same way that your Outlook gets updated and all of a sudden your machine is starting over when you're not ready for it. So there is that technical capability. And then there is a discussion as far as the medical standards go, whether you incorporate clinical practice guidelines, um, and if so, which ones do you incorporate? Which ones do you rely on for that decision support? And that's a serious issue. If you look at the database for clinical practice guidelines, there are thousands of them. I talk about that in the paper. Um, and some of them are written with their own agendas, right? Insurers write clinical practice guidelines with a view towards <laughs> 
minimizing costs, and a specialty group might write clinical practice guidelines with a view towards promoting its specialty and making everybody go to a specialist. And so we've also talked about the fact that there needs to be a way to have clinical practice guidelines that are widely accepted, that are reliable, um, that are not conflicting, that will enable really reliable decision support. So you've put your finger on, on a serious problem. Well, you certainly have talked about this. Can you just sort of reiterate, what are you, putting your other hand on, what are the two or three biggest purely ethical issues that you see with these systems? Ethical issues. Certainly, the lack of testing is a problem. We're deploying systems that may not be reliable, that doctors are complaining about quite bitterly, and that's fairly irresponsible. Um, not having mandatory adverse event reporting is irresponsible, I think. I mean, that's sort of, it's unbelievable that that doesn't have to happen. With new technology, when you have new technology, there always are going to be problems. You have to have thousands and thousands of people all over the country getting used to a new technology, adopting a new technology. There has to be follow-up. There has to be oversight. And the fact that we're not doing it responsibly is ethically problematic. Oh, okay, well, do you want to? Well, uh, another thing that has been brought up is hold harmless clauses. So a lot of these vendors are incorporating into the contract that they have with purchasers something called a hold harmless clause, which tells the purchaser that basically if something goes wrong, the vendor is to be held harmless, is not to be liable, and all the responsibility is assigned to the health care provider. And so you're going to get situations where something did go wrong with the computer system, and we have these reports all over the place. There's an early report where something went wrong with the backup system in a pharmacy, and they sent carts with all the wrong medications to the floors at the hospital. And the nurses caught it happily. It wasn't too busy, so nothing bad happened to patients. But that's an example of something that can go wrong. Um, there are computer shutdowns that can be very dangerous, all sorts of problems. And nevertheless, there are these hold harmless clauses in the contracts that immunize the vendors. So that's also problematic. That has received attention. There are professional organizations that have called for those to be eliminated, but they're still there. Uh, my question about the uh, current status of business association, associate regulation under the high tech mm -hmm. and so on. Um, one, I understand there's a draft regulation, but they haven't finalized that. That's one part. And the second part is uh, applying that, whatever the business associate um, regulations are to the cloud, i.e., if, you, if you're storing your stuff with Amazon, they give you a standard contract. So the idea of extending the business associate liabilities, responsibilities to Amazon or whoever your vendor is, um, is problematic. But the basic issue is what, what's the status of that now? Yeah, the High Tech Act in 2009, part of what it did is it revised HIPAA, and now business associates are just as liable as the health care providers. So it did extend coverage to business associates. That has been done. That is in place. Um, one issue that's brought up is what happens if your business associate is in another country? Because now we're shipping off, we're outsourcing certain medical functions to people in India or Thailand or whatever. So they're theoretically held responsible, but enforcement probably is going to be impossible. So that's a concern. But if Amazon is doing some function for a healthcare provider and they have a breach of confidential of privacy uh, under HIPAA right now they are responsible. Anything else? Okay, well thank you for coming out. It was a pleasure and have a great day.